Hello and welcome to Tabletop Bellhop Live, episode 17, Accessory to Gaming. Coming to you from Hamilton, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the RPG maitre d', answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We're here live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern on twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. We love hearing from our listeners and viewers. Each week, we hope to highlight some of that feedback, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions. And if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. You should also feel free to reach out to us on social media. Just look for Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Speaking of social media, Phil Hatfield commented over on MeWe regards to my Agricola look back. I still have Agricola and I still enjoy playing it. I would say give it a play about every three to four months. That's a fairly regular rotation. Well, thanks, Phil. I, though, I do wonder if you've given Caverna a try as that was what turned the Bellhop around. Now, Benjamin commented about Board Game Arena on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. So he says, I have played lots of games on BGA, mostly Race for the Galaxy, but also Puerto Rico, Seven Wonders, Roll for the Galaxy, Dice Forge, and Zulkin. I agree with most of your points. In particular, it's a pretty awkward place to learn games. I try most games that get released on BGA, but you really do have to read the rules beforehand, and there's a lot of quality of life things that you would expect a computer platform to look after that it either doesn't or does very awkwardly. The highlight of BGA for me is the turn-based mode, but also the lack of setup pack-down required. Real games of Race for the Galaxy take only six or seven minutes. Uh, sorry, real-time games of Race for the Galaxy only take six or seven minutes, which is great if I have a half an hour or less to kill. A point on the Seven Wonders implementation. I agree with everything you said about it, except bemoaning the lack of an expansion. I will happily play the game after uh, play game after game of Seven Wonders Base, and it was only released on BGA in July, so I have to, so to have released the expansion already would probably be detrimental. The improvement that I can see, however, is that they haven't implemented the two-player rules, and I would really like playing two-player. It adds an interesting level of complexity to the game. Also, I'm in the Love Dice Forge, yet never heard of Rattlebones Camp. Well, thanks for the detailed comment, Benjamin. I have to admit, I haven't done much real-time play at all on BGA. Board Game Arena is something I use when I find the time. Like, it's it's... I'm doing other things. I'm in the middle of working on my PC and I check in and make a couple moves and I stop. Then I'm working on a blog post. I publish the blog post. I go to BGA. I take a turn at the seven tables I'm playing at. Then I go do some social media and then I come back and take a few more turns. It's not often I have the time to sit down and play a full game. And when I do, then I feel guilty like I should be working on something else. It's the same reason I don't tend to play video games on my PC. That's why I do that on the PlayStation or on the Xbox, which is in a different room because then I'm sitting on a couch and it's relaxation time. When I'm at my PC, I feel like I have to be on. Um, your comment on Rattlebones, I don't know what it is. Why Why has no one heard of this game? It's, it's weird that no one's heard of it. It's a great quick filler, can usually be found dirt cheap, and I think it's well worth checking out. So look around at your discount shops. I know you can get it really cheap on Amazon right now, and I'm sure it's in some Black Friday deals. Sigurd Langseth also commented on the Week in Review post about Board Game Arena over on the blog. I play a lot of board games online. In my opinion, Board Game Arena is the best site for playing a whole game in one sitting and on a computer. But in slow games where you take a move now and then, on the bus, waiting for the water to boil, while a heavy computer game is loading, BGA falls way behind Bolajou, Boitlajou, I'm not sure exactly how you pronounce that, Bolaju, I think, or Yukata, or other smaller sites designated for just one board game, like Board Gaming Online or Terra Snellman, etc. Especially when using the phone to play. Some of the design choices that make BGA pretty and fast paced on a computer make it frustrating and bewildering on a phone. Board Game Arena is the only site I know that doesn't have a confirm action button at the end of the turn. I like how you point out that a computer implementation feels better than the normal board game for Seven Wonders. 
I feel the same way for through the ages. My friends and our, I are now on our 44th slow game over on Board Gaming Online. You should do one of these for Yukata and Boat Le Jou and do a comparison after doing so. Well, thanks for the comment, Sigurd. A comparison of the various online sites does sound like a worthwhile topic. Uh, Angie Games think we need to ding that one and uh, add it as a future topic. Uh, I have to say, personally, I've avoided playing BGA on my phone, so I have a lot more experience with it as a full screen system. But I can certainly see how a smaller screen could be a concern. And I hadn't thought about how the lack of a confirm would be even more important on uh, that uh, small screen where it's really easy to mistap and fat finger it. Uh, I know Mo had you had uh, commented a couple of times. You wish you could change your uh, oh, yeah. mind, and I, I find in in any board game, keeping your fingers on that piece until you've made your decision is a major mm. aspect of most of those games, uh, and this is definitely lacking from BGA. Just as an example, Takedo frustrates me with this one because it's things that wouldn't happen if you were playing the physical copy. Like you sit there and you choose a spot and you're going to a vista you've already had completed and you choose choose a cherry tree and then you get a big red arrow that says there are no more cherry trees left. And I'm like, come on. Like there's nowhere that tells me how many are left. If I was playing the physical game, I could see that. Let me back out. Like I don't even like just hit a back up and then and Terra Mystica, I don't know how many times I've done something and it's moved up the wrong track or something. But yes, I would love just a little, here's a summary of what you did this turn and confirm. And then make it so I can turn that off. So certain games like Seven Wonders, I played many times where I don't tend to make those mistakes. You can turn it off. So it should be a, a toggle, in my opinion, on or off. Uh, and she games points out that there are six cer cherry trees and you can see how many are out in everyone's hands. Yeah, it should just tell you. And plus, when you go, just be able to back out. Just like, no, sorry, there's no cherry trees. Let me pick a different action. It's not like I got to see cards. It's not like I drew something. Nothing's been revealed. The game state hasn't changed. Yep. So I didn't even know there were six cherry trees. Now, we did play the physical copy, and I remember holding them, but I don't remember counting them. So there you go. I'll try to remember there's six for the next time. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit the Bellhops tabletop? So every week, I like to do this look back uh, at the games we played, events attended, any other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at tabletopbellhop.com. So I finally got back to the table, the physical table, not the board game arena table. Uh, things seem to be normalizing now. Um, I say that, but then this week's been kind of shot too. But at least last week, <laughs> when I was working on this, things seemed normal, more normal. Um, we got the Monday night group together, and I hosted a game night at my place on Saturday. Sadly, Gloomhaven's still on hold, though. I'm hoping that starts up again, though I think it may be on pause this Friday again due to uh, American Turkey Day. But is it still out on your table? No, unfortunately, we had to clean it up. See, I think that's what cursed us. We haven't played since I left it set up. That's literally the last time we played was when we failed the Whispering Highlands or whatever, Windy Highlands adventure. And we're like, oh, you know what? We're just going to leave this set up and we'll come back to it next week. That's what cursed us. That's why we haven't played. And we had to clean it up for Extra Life, which I assumed the day I cleaned it up, Tori and Kat would be like, hey, we're free tonight. Do you want to play? <laughs> but it didn't happen. No, uh, it is not still set up. So a slight flashback. Do you remember our episode on Queen City Conquest? That was the big, well, no, not big, small, really personal gaming convention in Buffalo, New York. Um, when we talked about that, we did a special episode on it. I actually almost wore my Queen City Conquest t-shirt tonight. Uh, we talked about how Sean and Anshi Games spent a lot of the time at that con playing games from the play-to-win table. So what they had is a large table of board games all still in, sealed in box. Mm -hmm. You would sit down, punch it out if no one else had already, play it, and then fill out a sheet. And the winners were announced at the end of the con, raffle style, for all those board games that got played. There was a ton of games. Do you have any rough estimate on how many different games there were? There had to be at least 30, 35 games, maybe even more. It, there were some smaller ones mixed in. It was a, there was a, a range. But I, yeah, probably I'd probably say at least three dozen. Wow, that's impressive. Yeah. So of all those games, one of the ones I know you and and she games played was the networks 
And it was another one we were actually lucky enough to win. Actually, technically, Sean won a copy and was like, I'm not going to have anyone to play with, so you might as well take this home, which thank you for that. I finally got to play it. Like, QCC was, I don't know, when was that? September? Yep. So it was a while ago. Um, I finally got to play it this past Monday, and I have to say, so far, after one play, I'm impressed. Well, you know, and I'm glad to hear you liked it. Uh, aside from a bit of trouble while working out the two-player turn rotation mechanic that they had, which was a little a little odd, uh, it was a really enjoyable game between Angie Games and I, and I would happily sit down at that game again. Yeah, that we didn't. I haven't tried two players. I did notice there were variant rules. We had a full five players, so I, I dig being able to check out games at their full player count. So for those of you who don't know the game, this is a game by Gil Hova. He's uh, one of the hosts on the Onboard Games podcast and Ludology podcast. Uh, excellent game designer. This was one of his. This was his big breakthrough game. In this game, in the networks, you each control a TV network. So it's basically a drafting game where you're drafting shows, ads, and stars, and then slotting them into your three prime time time slots, like 8 p.m., 9 p.m., and 10 p.m. And then each turn is fairly simple because all you do is you either draft something new or you slot something you previously drafted. Now, you start off with a complete stinker of a network. I mean, this is the kind of the kind of programming that you would normally see at 2 a.m. back in the 90s when some networks yes. were still going off the air. We were we were joking that the one missing card was the CTV Midnight Walk, the City TV Midnight Walk. Yep, yep. I wanted that so bad. And I'm like, we need that. What I dig about this game is it felt very thematic. So, like, each show does best at a certain time slot. Each ad works best at certain times or maybe paired with a certain show. So if you're advertising, like, basketballs, it works better if it's on a sport channel. Um, the actors are very fickle. Note I'm using actors as general neutral. Are fickle and have all kinds of preferences. Like, this guy wants to be on a specific type of show or this woman refuses to be on a show with ads. And it's all about drafting the right cards to make the right matchups at the right time slot and earn the highest number of viewers by doing so. Yeah, managing the wealth of combinations throughout each season with the randomized options of what could be played out on the table really plays nicely. And I can only imagine that uh, the complexity was both uh, greater and more enjoyable with a five-player match. There were a lot more cards out, so the beginning of every round was fairly slow. Because there was a lot to look at, right? Yeah. There was a lot of stuff to choose from. And holy cow, does player order matter? Because the person who gets the draft first has a huge advantage, especially if there's only one blue, whatever blue was, blue show at 8 p.m. And two people want blue shows at 8 p.m. And then it was about trying. There was a, a lot of surprising amount of player interaction in the fact that it was looking at what other people want and making sure you got it before them or looking and going yeah he's going to take that eight o'clock show but that means i'm going to grab this actor and then he's not going to be able to slot that show because he doesn't have an actor for it and that means i can take that show next round and so on it's that kind of thinking it's very very neat that way and then adding to the theme each year in the game so you play i think it's five seasons uh, each representing a tv show season right a, a network season and at the end of each year your show is age now, most of the time, this means losing viewers, but it's cool because some of the shows were slow burn shows where you gain viewers over time or other ones like Spike in year three for whatever reason. I remember one was all about explosions and it was like you get 10 viewers the first year, then 14 viewers and then one and one because no one cares anymore. I guess they've seen everything blow up. It's like, yeah, I've seen enough stuff blow out. Now, all the shows do eventually burn out. Like once you get the four seasons, you're getting almost like one viewer a season and that's it. So it's all about keeping your network fresh with new shows and new new talent. Now, there is also an economic aspect. So. I'm not going to get into all the details, but basically the ads generate you money and most of the other cards require money to be able to play and keep up. And then at the end of every round, you have to do a little, um, you have to balance the books and you either pay. Now, this is not power grid level economics in any way, shape or form. Very basic. Like I think the highest number I had to count to was five. Yeah. You know, when I, when I saw the box, I was thinking, oh, uh, you know, this is sort of kitschy, maybe more of a gag. And, and UHF they're talking about in the chat room. And that was really the feel I kind of got off of it. Oh, yeah. Um, but I was very surprised that it was a strong and enjoyable game with some real replay value there. I agree. And the other thing I haven't mentioned yet is it's hilarious. Like the puns. The designers and whoever, the team that worked on this game did a fantastic job of 
parodying actual shows and actors. I, I don't think the ads were actual parodies, but they might have been. But like trying to figure out what show this one was, there was a couple cards we passed around. And we're like, oh, I think that must be whatever. I don't remember offhand. But yeah, we were laughing. I believe there are actually some self inserts in there as well. So the designer yeah. has some some Easter eggs in there. Yeah, I'm sure there are. It's it's the type of game that would have that. It's very much a designer's game. You can kind of the production values actually. I didn't mention that here or on the blog. Uh, are so so. It is not a shiny game. The the card art is silly. Um, the card thickness. They are not nice shiny fantasy flight laminated cards or there's no linen finish it's it's pretty basic um you're looking at cubes wooden cubes to track things and player boards and cards it's it's not a very shiny game it kind of looks like an indie game but don't let that scare you off because it's actually a really surprisingly good game for what it is uh and it has solo duo and uh up to five players nice and there are expansions i had a couple people tell me that the the expansions are worth picking up. I haven't dug into them yet. There, I believe there are actually rules in the back of the book for expansions already. If you check yeah, the there back might of the... be. It's the kind of stuff I skip over on the first play. Right. So after the networks, uh, I already know I have five people, so I thought this was the first perfect chance to grab that copy of St. Petersburg that just keeps hitting my table over and over again. We've been playing this one a lot lately. It's kind of the new hotness around here. The old hotness, really, because it's a rather old game. Uh, this was my chance to play a five player. So now the old version, which I've had and loved for years, only plays four players. Now this new game adds a new phase to the game. And the way the game's set up is every player goes first in every phase once. So by adding a new phase, it also allows you to add a fifth player, which is really nice to do. So I finally got to try St. Petersburg's second edition with five players. You know, and it's nice when a game can manage to up that player count without, uh, you know, detrimenting the play by doing nasty rules, even though it, even though historically it had always just been a four player game, Max. Correct. Now, overall, I have some kind of mixed feelings. In some ways, it played great. It didn't feel any different than playing three or four player. Turns were very quick. Um, didn't seem like there was a lot of downtime or I wasn't waiting to take my turn. But it was over way too quick. Now, with five people drafting cards, there's five decks in the game. And if any of the five decks run out, the game ends that round. You don't even get a whole play one more round. It's It ends this round. Once we get through the decks, we're done. And that just seemed to happen way quicker than it should. So part of the market is there's a set of tiles, and they make the market worth more points as the game goes on. We didn't even get to the bottom of that stack. So we didn't even get to see the whole market because we ended the game already. I wonder if uh, they could have adjusted that gameplay a bit, requiring maybe a second burning two decks rather than just one. Uh, maybe we have a house rule in the making here. Perhaps. Now, the new version did come with some expansions, though. Actually, it comes with like six or so modules you can add or remove as you want. And two of those add more cards. So I have a feeling that the game will be better with five players using one or more of those expansions. So that's our plan next time. So there's one they call um, the purple deck. It has purple cards that give some bonuses. I'm thinking if we throw the purple cards in, that'll just draw the... I just wanted one more round. If it just gotten one more round, it wouldn't have overstayed it welcome, and it would have felt like we finished a full game as opposed to having it feel like it cut short. I wonder if they were expecting the people would grow the game in a, a certain pattern and you bought it out of order. Um, right, like not bought it out of order, but sort of set, started adding, adding portions in the wrong order. Yeah, that's possible. Like adding the fifth player without adding the other stuff. Like I said, we, we didn't try. So we just played with the base rules. I do think it'll be better. I noted, uh, Will Chamberlain is in the chat and he played with us on Monday. So he played the game. He thought it was the, the length was perfect. So maybe it's just my opinion on that. I still want to try it with the new cards. If nothing else to use the expansion that came in the box I haven't used before. So going back last week, I talked about Extra Life an awful lot, and the week previous even more. Um, and I noted that I picked up a copy of Venus Next for Terraforming Mars during the event, but then didn't get a chance to actually play Venus Next. So I finally fixed that on Saturday. Uh, now this was the one that Anshi Games wasn't sold on. Uh, too many combo. Too many uh, cards. Yeah, I was going to get to that. She she thought it was a, a little bit much, but I'll. 
I, I didn't I don't agree with that, I don't think. I'm not sure. I'll get to it. So we played um it was only three players. So I dig Terraforming Mars three players. I actually think that may be the best player count. The board doesn't get too crowded and it flows really quick. Uh you get around the board very quickly and there's very few chances that uh you're gonna sit there waiting, right? Uh and everyone's gonna pass and one player is gonna take six turns or something like that as you wait for them to finish the turn that doesn't tend to happen when you play three players whereas i find with five players there's often one player that ends up having running out of money having to pass and just waiting for everyone else to finish up so it's nice and quick with three um i played with angie games so she had played before the other player uh, local gamer charles had played the base game but not that often now, Charles is kind of a like a local Uber gamer, right? Like he knows games, plays a lot of games. So it didn't take him long to pick up the game. And throwing Venus next in didn't seem to hinder his strategy or his ability to play. I'm shocked that knowing the game at all, Charles wasn't fully <laughs> up to speed on it already. I, I have a feeling it probably wasn't one of his favorite games. I don't think it's quite, a, I don't know, strategic, tactical enough. I don't know. He, he seemed to enjoy it. I will admit he won, which is, that's that's kind of the local gaming challenge, is if you can beat Charles, you're good at a game. So Venus Next comes with 59 new cards. So five of the new cards are corporations. The rest are all projects, or I, I tend to call them patents, but I guess they're technically called projects. That's a lot of new cards. You also get a new board, and all of this new stuff's all tied to Venus. So now, in addition to terraforming Mars, you're also working to terraform Venus. Now, what I thought was kind of neat was that terraforming Venus has absolutely nothing to do with terraforming Mars and thus has nothing to do with the end game. And you can terraform Venus or you cannot. It's completely optional. So the game still has the same old ending conditions of getting the heat up, the oxygen up, and getting the lakes in play. Where Venus is has nothing to do with that. Actually, interestingly enough, they know that there is no way terraforming Venus is just getting started at this point in the fictional game universe. And there's no way you could possibly terraform all of Venus in the time it would take to terraform Mars. So the best you can actually do is get it 30% done. It's interesting that they include something that was essentially impossible to complete. Um, I, I like it. I think it's cool. But I can definitely see how that might raise the uh, hackles of uh, some completionist gamers. Yeah, I could see that. What I also thought is I'm wondering if it opens them up to future expansions. So maybe something later, you get Venus later, and then you can do it up to 60%. Or they do terraforming Jovian or something. Oh, Jovian is Venus, isn't it? What? Uh, no, that's no, Jupiter. Jupiter. So yeah, if they did terraforming Jupiter... And then maybe you can get more of Venus done while you're playing Terraforming Jupiter. I don't know if that was opened up that way or not. Right. I thought it was cool. Like, I've always found Terraforming Mars, like, when you read the flavor text and you look at what's happening, it's surprisingly thematic, the things that your corporations are doing to improve these planets. And I thought this just fit that. The whole fact that, yeah, we're working on Venus, but we're not going to finish seemed to fit the feel of the game to me. So when we played, I got one of the brand new corps, and it was all about Venus tags. It has one of the stupidest start game conditions ever that I don't think should be in any game. So here is my first complaint about Terraforming Venus. You literally draw cards off the project deck until you draw three with the Venus tag. Now you also have to reveal them. So everyone who's really good at Terraforming Mars and plans their strategy around certain cards gets to see what's discarded. Now, when Angie Games played, she said they went through about half the deck. When we played, we went through about 30% of the deck before I found three Venus cards. So that's 30% of the deck is removed from the game right at the beginning. Now, with three players, you're not going to get through that whole deck. So that's just, it's just a pain. Like, everyone had to sit there and watch me flip cards until I saw Venus. Oh, there's a Venus tag. Like, it, it, that was silly. Like, I like the corp, and it worked mechanically, but having to sit there and, like, see the deck at the beginning, I did not like. So because I had this corp, I went, I'm doing Venus, right? I'm focusing on Venus just because I can. I did almost nothing on the main board. At the end of the game, I didn't have a single cube on Mars. I did put a couple lakes, but I didn't put a city or a forest or any of the special tiles. And I just wanted to see if this worked. And the fact that I came in second doing this means to me that the new stuff is a viable new strategy for trying to win Terraforming Mars, which is cool. Well, it certainly sounds like a, a strong expansion then. It's not something extra, but a real and viable alternative direction that you can take the ga your gameplay um, that still has a chance to win. It's not like you're wasting time over there. 
Yes, it's exactly how it felt. Now, what I'm not sure of, and this is where Anchi Games' note comes in, uh, she did note this time it was better than the first time she played, but she found the game really diluted by adding all these new cards in. So trying to do a core strategy was difficult because she couldn't find the cards she was used to finding. And I wonder if it's a choice, do you do Venus or not? Like, I don't know if Venus would fit into some other strategy, which I think would be better if you could combine it, right? Like, if it's a new way to play where I can work on greenery but also help out Venus a bit to give me some extra money, I think would be cooler than it's, I got to do Venus or I got to do Mars. And I can't tell. I've only played the one time. Like, I wonder, like, she felt it was watered down, and I wonder if I had done a Mars-based strategy if I would have felt the same. I, I guess more plays will tell. And uh, it's good to give games a chance. I wonder, I mean, you guys have both been playing Terraforming Mars a while now. It's, it's one, of your, one of your top games. Um, and I wonder if you guys have just become so used to the deck and so used to certain combos and, and aiming for those combos that are going to come up in the deck that, you know, you, and, and you aren't used to the new combos and the new possibilities added by this, you know, new 60 cards. Um, you know, change is hard. But uh, yeah, it's rare that anyone's first opinion of a game or an expansion is going to be the truth unless it's a really bad game, like a, yeah. a one on BGG. Yeah, one of those. We avoid those games at most at most cases. I do want to add one thing. I do want to try it with drafting. Anytime we're talking card combos or diluted deck, the fix I've seen for Terraforming Mars is to use the drafting variant. That's where you get your four projects, and instead of buying from those four, you have to pick one to keep and pass the left. Again, I think drafting would really help with Venus because there's more chance of the player who doesn't want Venus cards being able to get rid of them and the player who does want them being able to get a hold on them. Plus, of course, the hate drafting strategy of, well, I know she wants Venus cards, so I'm going to keep them so she doesn't get them. I think that would fix it. Well, it would help. I don't know about fix it because I'm not sure if there's something to fix yet. But I do, I do want to try it with drafting at some point. Just don't do drafting in Terraforming Mars 5 player unless you want like a three to four hour game. We record the show live Wednesday nights at 9.30 Eastern on Twitch, and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room, The Lobby. Thanks to our moderator, Anshi Games. Uh, tonight, we've got uh, our Zades just dropped in, Shadzar's there, nice. and Will Chamberlain all chatting. Um, basically, just been following along with the show so far. Uh, a little bit of chatter about uh, TV tropes and things as we talked about <laughs> networks. Um, Makes sense. And a little bit of discussion about whether or not Venus or Mars would be harder to actually terraform uh, <laughs> going on. I don't know, I'm thinking gas giants got to be pretty hard to terraform. Well, that's Jupiter. Yeah, I don't think I don't think you can terraform something that doesn't have any terra. Uh, <laughs> I thought Venus talked about how, oh no, it was just the pressure. The pressure is on the surface. So everything right. you build, you're basically building Cloud City. Everything you build in Venus next, like there's a whole new resource called floaters and you can right. collect floaters and there's a new award for floaters. That I didn't notice a couple. So wrong. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's not totally horrible, but yeah, it's, it's all about floaters. Award. And yeah, there's a milestone for floaters and award for Venus tags. That's something else that it adds to the base game. Okay. I did notice a couple of people noting Nightbot seems a little overly talkative, so that's something we'll look at tweaking before the next show. Um, you can find us all across the web now, and we grow with the support of listeners and viewers like you. So please take a minute to subscribe to our content on your favorite platform and help us spread our gaming advice to the world. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, we'll be sending out an email recapping all of the content we've released in the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, previews, giveaways, anything else we create, you'll get it there so you do not miss anything we put out. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage and you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. So, I mentioned giveaways. The Quiver Review is live. It went up yesterday. Head over to tabletopbellhop.com, click on Reviews, or just find one of the many links I spread all over social media the last couple days. Now, here's the short version. 
the Quiver is a pretty awesome piece of gamer luggage. It's a deluxe card-carrying case for transporting your cards in card-based games. Very durable, water-resistant, functional, and looks great. Head over to the blog for the full review, and once you're done checking that out, scroll down and use the raffle copter form to enter and to win a quiver of your own. This one is generating a lot of buzz. We're already at, I looked at it, 200, over 200 entries, which is fantastic. Uh, sorry, License to Slay, you were a cool piece of gamer bling, but the quiver is definitely winning out in the popularity contest right now. So earlier today, actually just before I came uh, did blah, blah. earlier today uh, before getting ready for the show I just before I sent out the newsletter I released my latest gamer gift guide I also was finally smart enough to add a link at tabletopbellhop.com homepage where you'll see down with the master list a button that says gamer gift guides and you can find all of them there's five of them now so on these guides, what I'm trying to think of are unusual gifts that people don't usually think of. Because I think most gamers out there have enough games or buy the games themselves. They buy anything they want. And it's hard to buy for a gamer with a large game collection. Or what do they own? What don't they own? What kind of games do they like? What expansions do they still need? And so on. It's way too much to try to figure out without just going, give me a wish list or send me your board game geek wish list. And who wants to do that? That's no fun. I think it's far cooler gift to give someone something for the games they already own. That's right. You aren't going to buy them something they don't already have or aren't already planning to get. So this is something that they you can get them that they aren't likely going to buy it for themselves, but will make what they do do. What? <laughs> let's not say that. That will make <laughs> what they... <laughs> oh. <laughs> and this is why I should follow show notes. <clears throat> no, nah, it's good. This, Improv is probably good. Because <laughs> this will make what they do like to play that much more enjoyable. Oh, I lost where I was. Okay. So the existing gift guides I've got are I've got one for the aspiring game designer. So this is like all kinds of prototyping stuff. I got blank cards, blank dice, uh, custom tokens, meeple, lots of stuff that's great for prototyping. Uh, the other one I have is for game organization. Now, this isn't like we talked about last week, where to put stuff on your shelf. This is for organizing the game. So you got box inserts and colored baggies. Love those colored baggies. Um, and and uh, like Petri dishes for games like Pandemic to hold your cubes. Uh, the next one is board game bling. In that one, I'm looking at upgrading your existing components. So like the Stonemeyer Games treasure chests. Um, and uh, other ways to improve the components for the games you already have. Then I did a very specific version of that, which I called Money, 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 all about replacing your board game currency. Yeah, we'll even talk about gaming money later in this episode. It really is that important to gamers. It definitely can be. Now, the gift guide I put out today is all about Etsy. Now, when I say awesome board game accessories, I don't think Etsy is a site that comes to mind for very, very many people at all. But there is a ton of awesome stuff to be found. Homemade stuff, 3D printed, laser cut word, uh, laser cut acrylics, and so much more. So what I did in this guide is I highlighted some of the coolest board game accessories I found browsing Etsy over the last few days. So honestly, Etsy gets a bad rap. They're often thought of the haven for unwanted knit goods and other crafty items. But there is a wealth of product there to explore if you only take the time to look. Now, I, you have to check out the gift guide because I did put a knit item on the gift guide because it was one of the most unique things I've ever seen. So that is one worth checking out. Uh. So one week from today, uh, Wednesday, when this is being recorded, for those of you listening on the podcast, that will be tomorrow for you. That's Wednesday, November 28th. We're going to have game designer Daniel Zayas on the show. I'm sure the chat has already started the Dr. Zaya song. If you have any questions you'd like us to ask Daniel, please send them to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. I personally want to know about his new game mechanisms, which is like concept, but with game mechanics. So you can learn more about him and his project by heading, heading to dzayas.com. dzayas.com.
So every week, as part of Throwback Thursday, I'm going to resurrect an old piece of gaming content, something I wrote years ago on another platform. I'll be republishing the original article, adding my thoughts about the topic now. Has my opinion changed? This week, I've got a round table on my game table, and we're taking a look at Shadows Over Camelot. I have to say, I think the last time I played this was probably about the time you reviewed this. <laughs> I don't. I'm not surprised by that, actually. Now, I originally reviewed this hidden role game back in 2006, and when I reviewed it, it broke my brain. Like it, I, I, you know, people talk about your brain, brain exploding, right? It was like that because back then, cooperative games were almost unheard of. Like I had a whole thing that I was shocked. I'm like, my God, you play against the game, and then you toss in one of the players as a traitor. Oh my God, mind blown. It just shocked me at the time. Now, I remember, as hazy as that memory may be, that the game, aside from that sort of mechanic, really felt like the Camelot, Camelot mythos. Uh, they captured the feel of the fiction quite well, uh, and, and that made the game enjoyable for me at the time. Yeah, I agree. They did a really good job of, of like, the because the, you're doing so many different things, right? You're defending Camelot, and you've got the Picts attacking on one side, and you've got the Saxons attacking on another side, and the Black Knights throwing a tournament, and you've got the Quest for the Grail, and you're trying to find Excalibur. Like, all of this going on at once. It did do a very good job of capturing the Arthurian myths. Now... I talk about how this game blew me away being an awesome co-op game. I don't even call it a co-op anymore. I don't consider it a co-op game because it's a hidden trader game. And now there are enough hidden trader games out there. There are tons that I consider hidden trader game a genre of its own. It's a form of social deduction. And amazingly enough, listeners out there, I actually like this social deduction game. Yeah, at the time, all those games were super unique, and you dove headfirst into modern hobby gaming, uh, far beyond the miniature game that we had been enjoying. Up, uh, and so when I did get back and got to play something, it was all new to me. So, yeah, it, well, back then this was this was a new thing. It was the brave new frontier, right? Two thousand and six, like there were hobby games were a thing. They just it wasn't. What did we say? 3,500 games released in 2017? <laughs> that didn't happen then. Like, I think there were maybe 3,500 games released total in the entire hobby industry. Yep. The other thing I thought was funny reading my review is I was like, oh, my God, this game is complicated. This is a bear to teach. And then I gave some, like, really bad suggestions. Like, don't give the knights powers. Don't do that. That's actually terrible. That makes the game way too hard. Um and then that was my other comment, which is probably because I was trying to dumb it down by removing the powers, was that the game was like so hard and almost impossible, but good in a frustrating kind of way. You know, I, I remember it being a bit overwhelming. And now I can't, this may have been because, again, it was new, you know, hobby gaming was new to me, but I do remember skipping the powers. Uh, yes. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> it was... you know, looking looking back uh, at some pictures on BGG to trigger my memory uh it's amusing in hindsight but you know i get why i would have thought it was so complex that then you know with all the pieces and the asp and the, the you know the complexity of it when you look at it thinking of it as someone you know who's played the game of life monopoly I and mean, you know your generic family games uh this is not clue so no <laughs> so my, my biggest complaints were the game is hard to teach and it's too hard and i gotta say nowadays i totally disagree with both of those now, we talked about this before, right? The game weight is so subjective. It is completely based on the player's previous experience. And back then, hobby games were new. Like, this was new material. This was, excuse me, new stuff. The fact that you had to advance the course of evil and then take your action, and your action could only just be moving, and you did so little on a turn, and you didn't roll dice to move, and combat was card-based. Like, th I thought that was heavy. Like, really heavy. I don't, like, back then, like, compared to Catan, it, it's heavier than Catan. But, like, now, I would almost consider this a gateway game. It's one I personally now find very easy to teach, and I think it's great for groups of new players. The thing is, I now know how to teach it. And we didn't have a teacher back then. We were running from a rule book. The other thing is, for hard, over the years, I've kind of solved 
Shadows Over the Camelot. I have played it a lot of times. It is one of my favorite games to bring out the public events, especially if we're going somewhere new. And I expect members of the public to be there and gamers I've never met before to be there. So I've taught and played this game so many times. And it's it's a puzzle, right? It's a co-op puzzle with a possible trader. And I've kind of solved that puzzle. Like my win ratio is ridiculously heavy balanced on the win side. And that doesn't matter if I'm the trader. That means I'm probably going to win as a trader. And if I'm a knight, I'm probably going to win as a knight. Unless playing with other experienced players. And then the knights do have an advantage in that game. I have a real hard time playing this game and not quarterbacking. Telling the other players what to do because I... I'm like, I know how to win. No, don't go there. Do this. So at this point, what I like to do with this game is I GM it, right? I moderate it. I set up the game. I get seven players around the table and I show them how to play and I guide their play. Now, this is something we haven't really spoken about much when we talk about replayability of games. Uh, but when you learn to beat games, now mm -hmm. the best games generally should avoid this problem uh, in design. But there are games where you will develop best patterns, which can break the odds uh, once you discover them. Yeah, it's definitely something that happens. This was also my complaint about Zombicide and why I stopped playing Zombicide. So I do still play Shadows Over Camelot, or at least I bring it out and my copy gets played because it is awesome for playing in public. The, is it, I don't think there's another game in my collection where you can do this, but players can literally drop in and out in the middle of a game which is fantastic for public play. So if you show up at the beginning of game night and there's four of you there, you set up Shadows or Camelot and you start playing. Then when someone shows up three turns in, you're like, hey, you want to play? You hand them a knight, you give them a health card at four, or a health die, you set it to four, you teach them how to play and you just start playing. Because the way this game works is something bad happens then something good happens. So it's perfectly balanced on every player's turn and removing a player or adding one in doesn't really break this. Now I will admit, you kind of stretch it a bit because anytime someone new joins, they come in at full health but really that's not a problem and again if i'm moderating the game and i look at everyone else only has two health i may add the new player in with a little less damage or a, a little damage starting up so they're kind of on the same field because you also don't want people to abuse it by quitting the game and jumping back in just to have an advantage but like i'd love the fact that people can jump in and out plus it draws a crowd because one of the coolest things in the game is it's a co-op card game where you're not allowed to talk about what cards you have or the numbers on your cards or the number of cards you have. You have to speak, uh, I'd say, in character. Like at this point, I encourage everyone playing to role play. Like play Sir Belvedere. Say, Lord Arthur, I need help in the final hour. Can you help me defeat the picks, right? I want people saying that, not, hey, Arthur, do you have a five I can use in this battle? And that's half the fun of the game. You know, because of the public nature of your particular gaming, uh, even a game that others might consider broken and, and passing on can live on because it's got that public nature that you can uh, bring it out and teach and enjoy and helping others play it and enjoy watching others play it, uh, even though, again, it may not be you sitting down and playing it. No, I totally agree. Actually, there's a surprising number of games in my collection that I only own because I run public play events and I'm part of the Windsor Gaming Resource. There are games that I probably will never play again on my own. Another example is Soro. I find Soro mind-numbingly boring, but it is great to set up in the middle of a game night and great for new people who walk in and great for people to play while waiting for a new game to start. Shadows Over Camelot does fall into that group. It's not something I'm probably going to break out downstairs on my game table, but I'll definitely bring it out to another game night. Now, I'm sure someone has to be thinking, but Mo hates social deduction games, doesn't he? And yes, in general, I do, but I love this one, and I think I may have figured out why. See, in this one, you're role-playing. So yes, if you're the traitor, you have to lie to your friends. But in this case, it's not me lying to my friends, it's Sir Belvedere lying to the other knights. For some reason, that level of disconnect makes the game way more enjoyable to me than standard social deduction games. Now, each episode, we look to answer one or more of your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions over to questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or you can head over to the webpage, tabletopbellhop.com, and click on Ask the Bellhop. Social media works, too. Uh, we're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. While I prefer questions come through the website, because then I can track them and they go on a spreadsheet, it's a lot easier, I'm not going to say no to someone asking me a question anywhere. Heck, you see me on the street. Toss me a game night question. I'll note it down in my phone. Yeah. 
Now this week, Jaden W emailed in to ask, what are your must have gaming accessories? Thanks for the question, Jaden. Uh, this is actually a follow up to another question asked by Jaden quite a while ago that was, are box inserts worth it? Now you can check out our answer to that one back on episode four of the podcast, which you can find in our back catalog. For the time being, we're leaving our entire back catalog available on the feed. So while some announcements aren't relevant anymore, the information, the meat of each episode, stays relevant because we're not just talking about the new, new hotness here on these shows. That is true. Uh, though I do have to admit, some of our quality isn't so great when you go that far back in our backlog. Just listen to us now and realize we've learned from our mistakes. Absolutely. Absolutely. So because we already talked about box inserts in the past, I'm not going to cover that. The point we made back then is that they're totally worth it if they help you get your games played. If you look at your game on your shelf and go, oh, that is too much to set up, and you don't play it and you look instead go, ooh, Suburbia is in that nice box insert. I can just throw it on the table, put out these things, and start playing. If a game gets played more often because you put an insert in it, to me, the insert is very much worth it. The other thing, it can also be worth it if it means you can fit more games on your shelves. I always give the example of Battlestar Galactica that is four of those big boxes. If you have all the expansions, condensed down to one with the broken token insert so the space that game takes up is 25 percent of what it would without the insert just remember the bellhops rule the best games in your collection are the ones that actually get played that is true so first off there are no must-have accessories there's nothing you have to have to play all you need is a game some players and a place to play none of those i would consider accessories Heck, you don't even need other players if you're into solo gaming. And for some solo game suggestions, check out episode 13, Han Shot First. Now, if you find a game that requires accessories, it's probably batteries. Because yeah. even a drawing game normally includes its own pen and paper and things to get you started. True enough. Your copy, your shiny, your classic copy of Dark Tower is no good without batteries in it. Though I guess nowadays you can grab the app. So there may not be must-have accessories, but there obviously are some really nice-to-have accessories. So the one gaming accessory that I think is more important than any other and that is going to give you the most bang for your buck is some way to organize your game components during play. Somewhere to sort and store all those bits, keeping everything separated and easy to access for all the players. Yeah, one of the main features of hobby games these days is little bits. And the more players you have, the more passing, reaching, scattering, and dropping you have to worry about. Very true. Now, I don't know if you can see them, those of you live on Twitch, but I use wooden salad bowls. Uh, these are shallow wooden bowls with flat bottoms. I originally bought them years ago for the SCA, Society for Creative Anachronism, something I dabbled in years ago. I think I found the first ones at thrift stores. I started with only two. Um, and I'm always looking for more. So hitting various value villages around Ontario, I've slowly upped my collection and now I'm up to, I think, 11. And that's enough for most games, except for The Colonists. That's the one game that I was still short about five bowls. What I dig about these, shallow, these bowls are they're shallow, so they're easy to see in across the table. They're hard to spill. Like if you spill them, you're not tipping the whole bowl. They just kind of tip on their side and maybe a bit of components dump out and you don't lose the whole bowl i really dig using these and now don't limit yourself to thinking about one bowl per type of item at a large table you can have a few different bowls of the same type or types of items inside and that way people don't have to reach all the way across your big gaming table to find that one bowl of bits that they need <laughs> that player seven on the other side was last using yeah, it's definitely like Terraforming Mars, the cubes, the, the resource cubes. The, the, like, the last time we played three players, we had three bowls. We each just had our own bowl. It was the easiest way to do it. Um, besides bowls, there are a ton of other options. I use bowls. I don't see any reason to use anything else most of the time. The one I see a lot locally are the silicon muffin baking cups. They usually come in a huge number of colors. They come in different shapes, which is cool. Like you can get different sizes, but you can also get like rectangles and crescent moons. Excuse me. You can get crescent moons, and they're generally really cheap. They're easy to store because they stack. Because they're silicon, they can even be flattened. And what I've noticed some of the locals gamers do because they're cheap enough is they just toss them in their game boxes, and every game's got its own set of silicon cups. 
But please, think of the environment. Don't use your paper muffin cups. <laughs> no. Or coffee filters. They just don't work. It kind of flops around everywhere. The other thing I've also used is a full muffin tin. Like, you know, a metal tin with six or more pockets for putting muffin in. What you'd put the silicon cups into. I first did this when I ran Marvel Heroic Roleplaying, which is a dice pool-based roleplaying game where you play Marvel superheroes, where you build dice pools out of dice and... I wanted. I bought sets of dice in different colors, so all the D4s are yellow and all the D6s are green. I don't remember the colors. And not everyone had enough dice to play this game because it requires an awful lot of dice in different colors. And I color coded them, and I put each die in a different uh, cup of the muff muffin tin. And we played, you just passed the tin around, which was really cool. And everyone made their dice pool, rolled, and then put the cups back. It worked really well. What's great about these is they are dirt cheap. Like if you don't have one at home that you haven't used in years sitting on that bottom drawer under your oven, that's you're strange because I think everyone does. It's one of those things. I think we probably have six in ours. Uh, if you don't, you can go to a dollar store usually and find tins cheap enough. Now, there's also the silicon ones. I personally prefer the metal because the silicon ones are floppy, floppy, floopy. Um, you can pass the metal ones around easier. So it's, hey, take my tray. Now, this, even more than the accessories, could be the real tip here. Go to the dollar store. Just mm. do it. Open your mind, walk up and down the aisles, and the number of useful tools you can find walking up and down those aisles is remarkable. Uh, I, as a photographer, I used to just, <laughs> once a week, go to the dollar store with $5 in my pocket, and I would come home with a week's worth of photography projects for $5. Except nowadays, I think every item in the store is five dollars. That's what it seems like all the well, local stores unfortunately, here. Unfortunately, the dollar store is horribly misnamed now. Yes, but yes, it is not even close. I don't, I don't even know what the under five dollar store maybe. Although I have seen six dollar items, so even that doesn't apply. No, but it's very true. There's actually quite a few things on this list that you can find at dollar stores and resale shops. It is worth shopping around. Now, any chit based hex encounter wargamer out there has probably seen and used counter trays these are vacuum foamed formed vacuum formed plastic trays uh these are so ubiquitous in the wargaming world that like stores like gmt who produces games if you go on their website you can buy the latest gmt games and right there there's a little like add-on button to add on counter trays right it's it's like the um impulse aisle at the war game store it's like oh don't forget to throw in some counter trays even better is a lot of more modern games and companies are now putting them in there so just like your euro games are coming with baggies uh war games are trying to come with counter trays now these are usually a bunch of rectangular slots with a lid and they stack they are great for chits but they're not so great for bigger components so, like, you're not going to be able to fit Meeple in here because they're not deep enough, but they're great for any game with a lot of counters. They're very cheap. You can order them in bulk, and this is what I think I really do need for the colonists instead of using my bowls. Uh, for podcast listeners who may not see the links we've got posted in the chat here, uh, if you think a lot like a small um, tray, tray of chocolates, um, it's, it's very much like a, th a tray full of thin chocolate squares. Uh, and they really are, for war gamers, they're just sort of the standardized box insert mm -hmm. for all your war games. Actually, that's, that might be a, a, a hack right there. Keep that insert from your pot of gold or whatever the, the box of the lower C chord. Maybe that's a good way to organize your board game components after the holidays. I'm going to have to look at that. Like that Frere Rocher tray. There that's you got go. Some nice, hey, I'm going to have to look at this. <laughs> so I think... The counter trays are specific to wargaming, but there's lots of companies out there now making trays specifically for us, for tabletop gamers. There's Zen Bins and uh, Game Trays are the two companies that immediately popped to mind to me that are well worth checking out. They make, uh, one of them does like for cards where it's actually easier to lift the cards that are designed a certain way. Um, the I can't remember which one it is. They stack and the lid becomes one entry, like one tray and the bottom becomes another tray and then you can put them together. There's some really nice ones out there. And then I already mentioned on the gift guide, but man, look on Etsy. Like there is some really neat containers. Um, on the blog post where I talked about this, I actually linked a container that holds your things and it has a little lip specifically designed for getting the bits into baggies when you're done playing. I thought that was brilliant. Now, I haven't actually tried these, but they look really cool. You know, and the best accessories really have some extra thought about how they're used. Those little things, 
Like that lip to help get things back into your baggie can really make all the difference and might be worth a little extra you might pay over the dollar store versions. Very true. So in my opinion, the most important thing is having something keep your components sorted, stored and easy to access. That's, that's my number one. That's if there was a must have, that's it. You don't want to just dump all your stuff out on the table with a big mess of bits everywhere. Basically, you don't want to waste game time trying to sort and find things while you're playing. Everything should be easy to access. Uh, it goes back to, we were talking last episode about 5S and the golden zone. You want any component you're going to use often to be in arm's reach to all the players, if that means multiple bowls or not. That's going to speed up gameplay, and speeding up gameplay is going to make your game night more enjoyable. So the accessory is actually making your games better. That's what you're looking for. Now, the next step is keeping everything in place. Now, we all have friends in our gaming groups or otherwise, we're just a bit clumsy. It's not mm -hmm. usually that person's fault. There may even be medical reasons. Coordination <laughs> is hard. It's a life skill that you actually have to develop, and most of us take it for granted. <laughs> Very true. Oh, I'm just imagining uh, Little G playing uh, anything with components and how bad that could be. So over the years, anyone who's a hobby gamer has probably lived through the earthquake of Catan or the great disaster of Carcassonne, right? Someone bumps the table or someone with long sleeves catches the corner of a tile and, oh my God, the game's ruined. Oh, did, your, what, did you have a city here? I can't remember. Oh, I've got this road left. Where does it go? Oh, it's so frustrating. But there is a really simple, quick fix that I discovered running 4th edition Dungeons of Dragons. I know a lot of people don't like Dungeons and Dragons. Maybe here's the one good thing that came out of 4E D&D to you. I personally love the system, so don't look at me for that. Is shelf liner, sometimes called drawer liner or non-slip netting or grip liner. This is a roll of puffy stuff that's non-stick but also non-slip. It grips the table, and whatever you push on it, any tiles on it, grip it. This stuff works fantastic. So now, there are a lot of different uh, terms used for this, and there are a lot of different options. Make sure you buy specifically stated non-adhesive, because yes. you can get adhesive stuff, and that will ruin your day a lot. You don't want to make that mistake on your expensive gaming table. So I guess you could get the glue stuff and coat your whole table but i'm assuming you probably have games where you want stuff to slide as often as i play games with tiles i'm also playing flicking games and flicking games on a grip mat are probably not very fun that, there's that that'll be a oh i'm totally got to take some of that and put it on a patch of pitch car at some point call it like the sand trap or something anyway i'm, I'm getting distracted with the possibilities so I personally get mine at Canadian Tire uh, here in Canada. You can get it everywhere. Amazon, Walmart, Dollar Store. So Dollarama is the, the brand we were talking about earlier. That's the, the Canadian Dollar Store. It's in and out. Like you'll find it and then it won't be there for months and you'll go in and they have it. I usually buy a couple rolls. The other thing I dig for this is you, it's easy to cut. So it comes very wide. So I usually buy a roll and cut it in half. So I end up with two sheets. The other thing that's kind of cool is you can get different colors. So if you like playing Catan, you can get a blue because the edge of the Catan map is, is water, right? It's an island. Or you can get, like when I did RPGs, I had a brown set that I used for my outdoor RPG maps. And I used a black set for dungeons. Now, this stuff is generally inexpensive, that it's not a deal breaker to pick up extra rolls beyond what you need to just hold down your gen your general uh one or two boards. Yes, I, they are. I, it's such a cheap and easy fix. And it works so well. Like Wasteland Express Delivery Service, I can't imagine playing that without her follow. Follow the board game without a grip mat? I can't. Oh, it would be horrible. You'd move your minis and the things would get shifted. It would be terrible. So now that you've got your tiles, rooms, maps, your board stuck in place, what you need is something for the stuff that goes on top, right? So again, this goes back to 4th Ed D&D for me. I needed a way down to put down the chairs, tables, bookshelves, and mimics on my maps. So what I would started using was poster tack or stick tack or blue tack. Again, there's a ton of names for this stuff, but the putty-like, play doh -y like stuff um, for sticking posters to walls, is poster tack is one of the names. You roll up a little ball of the stuff, you put it on the back of the chit tile, and stick it to your board. 
So now your the brand name of it is Sticktack. That's S T I K dash T A K. Uh, but you can find lots of other versions, like Mo was saying. Just be aware that again, be cautious to make sure you're getting reusable stuff and mm -hmm. try not to cheap out here because the cheaper stuff will damage your uh, services faster. Um, it is, uh, you know, it's just something you want to be a little careful of and, and don't buy the cheapest stuff you can find on Amazon. Yeah, I found, I don't know why, but the blue stuff seems better than the white stuff, though I have no real reason to give you that answer. Another trick I learned in art class in high school is that stuff makes a fantastic pencil eraser. So here's an important tip, kind of goes with what Sean just said. No matter how good a quality of blue tack, stick tack you buy, take it off when you're done. Don't leave it on because it will stain your components. I learned this the hard way. Now, it does take weeks. It's not the kind of thing that's going to happen during one night's play. And you're probably okay leaving Gloomhaven set up for a week with some stick tack on the board. But even then, I would just remove it because what happens is some of the oil that's in the tack seeps into the cardboard and stains it. You end up with like this wet spot that constantly looks wet no matter what you do. So just remember, when you pack up your game at the end of the night, remove all the blue tack. Now, the stuff's reusable. So... When you remove all the blue tack, you just put it back in the ball and put the ball wherever you keep your blue tack ball. Mine's over here. Um, the cool part about this is you basically can buy one pack and you never have to buy it again. Like, I think the stuff I have was bought in that high school art class and I still use it to this day. Hey, 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 we aren't going to get sponsored by these companies if you tell people not to buy it all the time. <laughs> okay, okay. Sorry, blue tack by Elmer. Ding. No. <laughs> Next episode, Tabletop Bellhop Podcast, sponsored by Elmer's Glue. No. So th those are the big ones, right? Th those Now you have somewhere to put all your bits, and you got everything stuck in place. So the next one I'm going to toss out is not useful for every game, but is very useful for a wide number of games, and that's a set of poker chips. I don't know what it is with games and lousy money and paper money. Like I did a full gamer gift guide I mentioned earlier on replacement money. And while metal coins and stuff are awesome and you may want to make that step, but you just need a basic set of poker chips that you can use in almost any game you have. Whether it's tracking money or victory points or health in Star Realms, it is a replacement counter system for any game component. Now, I actually started doing a little bit of research on this. I was interested to see if I could figure out where the origins of paper money and games were. And that, that was basically a dead end. Uh, it goes back quite a ways, obviously. But what I discovered was the gaming hobby in general has a deep and passionate hatred for paper money. But they it, keep using it. It is it is the gamers, and I don't know about the game designers, but the gamers have this violent anger when oh, yeah. they find or touch paper money. Uh, so one of the big awesome things I found was... Uh, replacing all of your paper money with poker chips. And mm -hmm. so what, what people will do is, even if they're playing Monopoly, they'll uh, take one of each denomination of uh, dollar bill, put it on the table with the respective poker chip on it, so mm -hmm. you can just glance down the table and check what your, uh, what your values are uh, and never have to handle paper money again. No, I agree. I, I, I admit, I'm not, I don't hate it as much as some people but when you're handling a lot of it, it is so much easier to do change with chips. Uh, Power Grid's the big one there, right? Power Grid's the one game that I'm like, no, use poker chips. The only problem with using poker chips and Power Grid is it's supposed to be hidden money. So if you to do it proper, you almost need like a DM screen. Like you need some kind of screen to put your chips behind. Most people just throw that out and play with open money, but it that makes the game too long. You do too much math trying to figure out what other people have, and it makes the auctions, I don't know, to me more cutthroat, which is not good for the game. But anyway, different thing paper money in that game sucks because there's just so much changing hands um the newest version of st petersburg right i keep going on about how awesome it is i'll let you in on a secret i swapped out the money for the first edition and then sold my first edition copy Shh, don't tell anyone because the money was better in the first edition the new one was like this plasticky stuff i can't stand it so going back to poker chips poker chips come in a huge range of prices like you can get dirt cheap ones, or you can spend thousands of dollars on poker chips. It's kind of nuts. Um, I did research into this when I did the Money, Money, Money Gamer Gift Guide. Um, 
What I love now, though, um, I've talked about them a lot, actually, are the Iron Clays from Roxy Games. Like, those are the ones that came in my copies of Brass, Brass Lancashire and Birmingham for the Kickstarter. You can buy them on their own. Now, I don't know. I know they're available on Amazon for 50 bucks. I don't know if that's the MSRP or if that's someone who's opening up copies of Brass and selling them. I honestly can't tell. It's not a Roxley store. So I'm not sure what the supposed price is, but they're not cheap. But man, these are nice. What I really like, besides the fact they just look beautiful and they got a nice texture to them and a fantastic weight, is they don't have the casino iconography. There's something about that casino iconography that bugs me when I'm not playing a gambling game. I hate seeing spades, hearts, and diamonds and a couple D6s on my chips, even when playing Power Grid. It's just something about that pulls me out of the game. I now feel like I'm gambling instead of handling money. Now, and again, hit up a dollar store. A lot of the uh, a lot of the dollar stores are gonna have um, poker chips uh, there in the gaming aisle. So, mm-hmm. so I've never looked there. I'm surprised you can get them that cheap. The set I I have two sets now because of the iron clays. The other ones I have are from my parents. Like they just bought one of those metal tin poker sets. It came with a couple decks of cards and a, a big felt mat with the dealer and all that stuff on it. And I inherited that when when they they left their house. So and, and just they were. Uh, by the way, Roxley is selling it for $51 Canadian, $39 US for the Iron Clays. So good to know. The price on Amazon is you are overpaying. Do not overpay for games. Like, seriously, follow tabletop underscore deals. You'll find some good deals usually. Okay. I, I refuse. Don't pay more than MSRP if you can help it. So, yeah, I guess they should only be about 40 US. Okay, so you, you can buy to, them right from Roxley.com. That's good Yeah, if you, yeah, if you go to Roxley, you've got them for $39 US. Oh, good to know. I should have did that research. I'll have, have to swap something up. I got a link to some switch my link up on the money 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 so those are my big things right those are the accessories if if i was to say excuse me what you must have those are the items you most want to have because you don't need any of this anything else we mentioned the rest of the show to me is a bonus this is stuff you don't need in any way but may want because they're cool to have but you do want a way to organize your bits Keep your stuff in place and just pick up a set of poker chips at some point because they're so universally useful for board games in general. So my next one is replacement resources. So this is replacing your chits and cubes with something cooler. Uh, the industry leader on this is Stone Mayor Games. They're the people who do Scythe. They make boxes called treasure chests, and they are to replace your bits. And they have a bunch of different treasure chests if you head over to roxley or not roxley sorry stonemeyer.com i'm sure angie games will drop a link it'll also be in the show notes you can buy a variety of these treasure chests now the first couple that came out were themed specifically to stonemeyer games like i think the first one was replacement components for euphoria it was popular enough that they started putting out generic ones so you can get basically a Catan set now these are like little clay 3d full color bits as opposed to a chit or a cube very neat increases immersion but again you don't need this this is just a cool to have um another thing to look at is metal coins and other money again check out the money gamer gift guide there are a lot of surprisingly affordable metal coins out there like if you have an asian themed game you can get chinese fortune coins dirt cheap all over the place online from warehouse places amazon etc you can get themed fantasy coins you can get sci-fi coins metal coins are surprisingly accessible nowadays you can also get them specific for specific games if you're into that like if you pick up the tuscany expansion for viticulture it has metal coins in it and you can buy those separate but like at this point i think you're better off buying generic coins you can move around to different games then there's companies out there that their entire business model is putting out replacement resources one of the coolest that has some of the nicest stuff is Meeple Source. That is all Meeple Source does is sell you upgrades for your existing games. Now, this is a lot like box inserts. They're not required, but they can make the game better in some ways, and they might help you get it to the table more. And like we say, anything that helps you get that game to the table more could be worth it for you. Mm-hmm. 
Now, another one, laser cut acrylics. These are getting more and more popular. I personally worked with Litco. We're going back to fourth ed D&D here. Um, back in the day, they were Litco Aero Systems who made plastic parts for airplanes who also had a small selection of wargaming paraphernalia, like little bits to, to play your war games. They started getting into board gaming, and I worked with them to produce some tokens for 4th edition D&D. Nowadays, they make all kinds of things. They've got movement templates for X-Wing, all kinds of tokens and counters. They've got inspiration tokens for 5th ed D&D. They have these amazing flight stands that are hexagonal. They're, they're the perfect size for your games of Twilight Imperium or Eclipse, so that the ships actually hover over the board and you can fit more people on the top. Litco makes some really nice stuff on their site, and they're not the only company doing it. Just I personally worked with them. I have no affiliate link with them. I have no tie to Litco except for the fact that back in the fourth D and D day, they were willing to work with me to come up with some new stuff. It's always good to have a company that you can uh, you know talk to and interact with, and and are willing to to work with the gamers. Yeah, I agree. Now, of course, the next step, now that it is 2018, it is becoming more and more easy and popular to 3D print your own stuff. Again, I'm going to call out to Etsy. I will admit, I do have a tie to Etsy slightly. I do have an affiliate account with Etsy, so Etsy links we share do give me a portion of the profits. I don't remember what it is. As usual, it doesn't cost you anything. That is not why I'm pushing Etsy so much. It's because there is so much awesome stuff. There is a ton of 3D printed stuff on Etsy that is amazing. There is a set where you can replace every piece of Terraforming Mars except the cards and the board with 3D tiles. So you have 3D forests, 3D uh, lakes, 3D cities, 3D the 10 special tiles, right? Like the, the, the atomic blast and the volcano. Replace all of that. Replace the counters. It is fantastic. There is some amazing 3D printed scenery for Imperial Assault and Gloomhaven. Some of the neater stuff I found there was you actually take the tokens in the game and put them on the 3D piece to give it some color. So you have like the bottom of the treasure chest and you put the treasure chest tile on top and it makes it look more like a 3D treasure chest. Very cool stuff. Um, there's also Shapeways. I admit I had a real hard time finding stuff on Shapeways. Shapeways is another 3D site. Shapeways is fantastic if you want some custom dice. But if you're looking for Imperial Assault or Gloomhaven stuff or stuff for existing games, I don't know if there's licensing issues there or what, but I found it really hard to find anything. I got to say it, Etsy has some amazing stuff. Uh, and if you happen to own a 3D printer, uh, you can. there are designs of plenty out there for you to, to get, download and print your own. Uh, more and more folks are getting those in their own homes. So, yeah, that's definitely. Well, actually, to be honest, you can tell because if you go on Etsy, there are an awful lot of people selling very similar Terraforming Mars tiles. So it's worth shopping around. Like, keep looking around because you may find someone cheaper than someone else. Uh, up next, game mats. Game mats are becoming more and more. It's not just for card games anymore. Um, I personally have used Arts Cow to print my own gaming mats for Dice Masters. I went and on Board Game Geek, found a file, uploaded the image, and got uh, mouse pads sent to me that are perfect for player mats. Perfect size for it. I've also got some great three by three mats for playing games like X Wing. I've got a Death Star mat. It's not actually officially the Death Star. I think it's called the Space Station mat. And I've got one for um, the Star Trek game, Star Trek Ascendancy. Um, you can get mats for specific games like this, or you can get them custom made. The one thing is they're great for gaming on. Like being able to pick things up on a neoprene mat is surprisingly easier than picking it up on a heavy table. And these all make fantastic surfaces for dexterity games. Now, again, these, these just aren't for your CCGs anymore. Game mats are a rapidly growing market, uh, and people and companies are really starting to understand the importance of working services. You're, and you're seeing in a lot of different markets, too. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll notice uh, even in the video gaming market with the new tabletop uh, things that are coming out for your keyboard and your, your full-size mouse pads uh, just to give you bigger and better working surfaces to, to use. Yeah, I don't know if like the, the price of neoprene dropped or just the popularity grew. I don't know what it is, but they're everywhere. Like, even going to gaming conventions, there are booths where all they're selling is various mats. So the last thing I'm going to mention is we talked about blinging out your game and improving your game area. What about your game room? So really quickly, some of the cool stuff you can do. 
check out our tech at the table and our sound episode because throw in some wireless speakers, especially if you can kind of get them hidden out of the way. Toss in some programmable lighting like your hue lighting and then throw down one of those custom game tables like a table of ultimate gaming or boardgametables.com has some nice ones or the one company i do have to pimp here is uh sorry recommend i know some people don't like that term anymore should not use it one of the companies i do have to recommend because i've actually used their tables i don't own one is game toppers this is a much more affordable version of a deluxe game table because it's a piece that just goes on top of your existing table. So when game night's done, you put it away and you can have dinner and then you pull it out when it's time to play. Uh, Much more affordable than a full game table and just as effective. Uh, When you go to cons, you'll see these all over the place. Game Toppers works with almost all the local publishers, not local, all the publishers, and will give them Game Toppers to use for their demo games really dig the game topper to things now this is something if i ever win the lottery like i've got a nice game table it's a four by four four by eight sorry but it's a board game table it doesn't have cup holders it's not inset it doesn't have a nice neoprene mat like we're talking about uh or even felt right i i don't have a tray i can pull out from my dm screen i just have a table these are obviously high end nice to haves but heck, if you're going to pimp out your games, why not pick out, pimp out, I'm saying it again. Guess If you're going to bling out your games, why not bling out your game room? Yeah, we've talked about, lots about tech at the table and, uh, you know, that definitely counts as an accessory. Uh, all your, all your various, uh, gadgets and whatnot can make it fun, but are definitely not necessary. That is true. And there are so many accessories. Like, I didn't even get into transporting games. Like, the quiver we're giving away, I didn't talk about gamer luggage. Um, remember, if you're interested, check out the review. You can win a quiver of your own. Uh, how great cajon bags are for transporting square box games. They can get into dice towers, dice trays, custom dice, metal dice, dice that blink when you roll a crit. We could probably go on for hours. But this was a great talk. If you'd like to read more on the topic, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice, where you'll see this and other questions answered in blog form, as well as finding all the gamer gift guides. That is true. Be sure to send us your questions over on the website under Ask the Bellhop, or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Patreon patrons at the good tip or better level get their questions bumped to the top of our question list. Speaking of our Patreon, a shout out and a thank you to our backers. Their support helps make this show possible. Misdirected Mark, thank you for backing us. You guys can join Phil, Chris, and Bob every Tuesday night at 845 Eastern as they talk games and game mastering. And politics sometimes. Brian Kurtz, (laughs) thank you. Duran Barnett, thanks. Joe Swick, we appreciate the support. Steve D., thank you. Jeff Seuss, thank you. Well, that was the double bell. This means my shift is coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletop bellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop live to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here here live, thank you for joining us. We'd like to invite you to hang around and join us in the penthouse suite for an off-the-books after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. Game on.